I want to continue in our series, The Doctrine of Faith. So let's look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Doctrine of Faith part 2, we'll say. Tonight we're going to talk about faith takes action. Faith takes action. Now that's kind of double fold. Because <laughs> it's one, faith takes action like it does. It has an action to it. It has an action with it. But faith also requires action. <laughs> As we we're going to see tonight. So it's got kind of a double meaning. Faith takes action. Like faith... Is, it, true faith is not just going to sit still. True faith is going to say, I want to do, I want to do, I want to prove my belief. I want to, I want to prove my faith by action. Then on the other side, true faith requires action. So we could say faith takes action and kind of covers both. So James chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 14. It says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, And have not works. Can faith save him? As a brother or sister, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? In other words, James is saying, If you just say unto somebody who's in need, you say, Well, may you be warmed and be filled. That's not going to do them any good. It's not helping them stay warm. It's not helping them be filled. You're just saying it. That's good. But there's no action with it to actually help them. To be a blessing unto them. You're not putting any action to that faith. You're just declaring it over them and then walking away. So verse 17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So James is pretty straightforward to say if your faith doesn't have actions, it's dead. It's like a doornail. It's dead. It has nothing. Because true faith is going to act. True faith is going to take action. <laughs> That's like, I have faith in my marriage, so it takes action to show that love to my wife. So, I mean, if we get this in some regard, your faith in your job will make you work your job. Not just saying, well, I got faith in my job. And then you go sit down and do nothing. Then the boss says, why aren't you working? Well, I got, I got faith. I got faith in my job. It's, it's going to always be here. It's not going anywhere. Well, it'll go somewhere if you don't put any action to it. It's going to go right out of the door as the boss gives you a pink slip and kicks you out the, kicks you out the plant or wherever it is that you work. Because you're not putting any action to it. True faith says, you know what, I'm going to prove my faith. That's why faith speaks to mountains and has them moved. Faith, true faith will speak to a mountain and watch it be moved. You know, some people say, well, I prayed to God and this, you know, this you know, happened and this still happened and that still happened. Well, how much action and how much faith did you put into it? Because sometimes we'll pray for something, but we'll never prepare the way for that to actually happen. Sometimes we'll pray for something in faith, which is not a bad thing, but we never prepare for it to actually happen. We just wait. We just wait for it. Well, I guess it's not happening itself. You know, it's <laughs> that's you know, like if you, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll give an example. Like when I had, you know, shingles, one of the God's graffitis because I was working so hard. And anyway, so when that came to pass. You know, I was declaring throughout the whole time that we're working because I, I thought it was a bug bite or a spider bite. So I kept declaring faith that healed in the name of Jesus, healed in the name of Jesus. Just kept declaring it by faith. But I realized, wait a minute. All right, now that, now that this is over, now that I'm not having to be so strapped for time, let me put action to my faith and say, all right, doctor, what is this so I can accurately pray against it? That was action of me saying, all right, I'm putting faith to this. I'm praying. I'm taking the time to address it. But now I've got to put more action to to conquer this. And so I went to the doctor and they told me exactly what it was. Told me what I needed to do uh, to kind of overcome it. Told me, you know, how, whatever the, you know, called it shingles or whatever. So I was able to give it a name and be able to curse it with my faith by my mouth. But that still is an action of prayer. 
That still is an action of taking care of my body and doing what has been, was told of me. I'm putting action to it and seeing that come about. And if you notice, I don't have that problem anymore. Why? Because the faith and the action overcame the issue. So faith and action will come together. It proves your faith, but it takes action as well. So even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show, I will show thee my faith by my works. In other words, he says, you try to show me your faith without your works. You're not going to be able to prove anything. He says, but let me show you my faith by what I'm doing. Amen. Amen. You know, that's like I think of Pastor Chris. He's, he's kind of uh, preached it for quite a few years now. But he said, you know, some of, some of the guys under him would say they were called to ministry. And he would tell them, he said, all right. He said, you've been called to ministry. You've been saying this for 20 years. Where is your action? Where is your faith in it? You've been saying it for years. Where's the action to go with it? Where's the, where's the proof that's going to back up you're actually called? Now we can say, well, that seems kind of harsh. Well, if ministry's in you, it's going to come out of you. I mean, you, you, you can't hold it in. If ministry's on you and in you, it's going to come out of you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come out or bust. It's going to be like the Bible says, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. It's going to move. It's going to cause you to move and do something if it's really in you. <laughs> if it's not in you, you just be a bump on a log. You don't really care. You're just like, I'm called to be a minister. And then you just sit there and twiddle your thumbs. I go, I get, not that it's all about me, I get a little antsy if I don't have anything to do. Like even, even on my off days, if I can't find something around the house to do, and usually it's ministry related or job related or house related or whatever, there, it, it bothers me. It's almost like to the point where I can't sit still to just breathe because there's something in me that's, that's wanting not just to do because I'm not content, but I'm like, all right, Lord, you've given me health and strength. You've given me, you know, uh, you're giving me boys to raise, so I want to spend time with them. You're giving me a wife to husband, so I want to take care of her. You're giving me a church and a ministry to run, so I take care of it. Lord, you're giving us a house, so I take care of it. Lord, you're giving me a job, so I take care of it. So out of those five things, there's always something to do. And when you're called to those things, you don't want to see any of those lie dormant. You don't want to see any of them neglected, so you take care of all five things. So if ministry or Whatever your calling is, is really in you. It's going to come out. That's like, you know, I can take Dr. Shaler, for example. Not only does she teach here, she teaches at school. And when she's not doing that, she's doing online stuff. And when she's not doing that, she goes to jail and teaches. I mean, it's just that teaching anointing, that teaching gift just comes out of her everywhere that she goes. Now, granted, you know, we've all got our own giftings and callings, but if it's really in you, that faith will be put to action because that faith is in you to come out. So now we're not just talking about giftings and callings, but we're talking about any kind of faith will be backed up by action. Even the word here says, it says, let me show you my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. Okay? The devils also believe and tremble. So your faith of just declaring it means nothing. Because even the devil and the demons know that there's only but one God. But does their Faith provide action, yeah, in the opposite direction. <laughs> but, it's, but their faith is not like what a Christian's faith should be. It's in believing God that He is our Savior, that He's the only way, the truth, and the life. He's the one that has set us free and given us salvation. Their faith is in, yes, we know He's the true and living God, but our faith doesn't require action of that nature. Our, our faith is in we're his enemy, so we've got to do what we need to do to get people to come to hell with us, not to heaven with him. That should not be the testimony of any Christian. Any, any Christian, any person that declares their Christianity and says, I love God, I love God, I want to see people born again, and then they do nothing for the kingdom? Where's your faith? Because even the Great Commission says to go ye therefore, that's an action. And that action should be proving your faith. I got so much faith in God, I'm going to witness to, I don't care who it is, I'm going to go to Walmart and find somebody to witness to. I'm going to go to Kroger and witness to somebody. I'm just going to walk around town or figure out somebody I can witness to because my faith is in my God that much that I don't want to see anybody die and go to hell. 
So it proves that your, your faith in God will be proven by your action. But wilt thou know, O vain man, <laughs> wilt thou know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So that's twice that's been said. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Hmm. When he had offered Isaac up his son, or his son upon the altar. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect or made complete. So even in the Old Testament, Abraham's faith was proven complete because he acted upon it. Not just because he declared it, because he acted upon it. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed, or we would say accounted, unto him for righteousness or in right standing with God. And he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now, this is not a message to say that we can work our way into heaven and that buys us salvation. That is not what we're saying. What we're saying is your faith should motivate you to have an action to prove your faithfulness to God, to prove your belief in God because you believe in Him. Because if Jesus said He's the only way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by Him, what, where do Christians think they can just sit and not do anything? Where do Christians, why do Christians believe this lie? Well, I believe he's Jesus, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and then they do nothing. That should, one, convict us to say, you know what? I'm just going to witness everybody. It doesn't mean you got to be some superstar and you're just 24 7 and you're just out there preaching and Bible thumping people. No, no, no. All you got to do is live your life as a living epistle. When the Word of God is, it, when, there's a, when there's an opportunity to share the Word of God, share the Word of God. Don't hesitate. Because faith, true faith is looking for an opportunity to, to sow seed. True faith is looking for an opportunity to sow seed in somebody else's life. But that's still an action. That's still something being done to prove your faith. Verse 25, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? When she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. Bless her heart, Rahab always gets called the harlot. Even here in the New Testament, she's still referred to as the harlot. But didn't her faith set her apart? Didn't her faith and her justification of her works set her aside and it saved her, her and her family? Absolutely, it did. Praise God. So, even Rahab, she, she does the work and she's... And she's uh, added to the New Testament here that of her faith through action of what she did to prove that she believed in God. She did not know Him, but she had enough faith to risk her life to say, here, let me hide you from these guys that are looking to kill you. Let me put to action to take care of you because I believe in your God, even though I've never met Him, I've never prayed to Him, I've never whatever... I've got enough faith in Him because I've heard the stories, I've heard the testimonies of your God. I want to put action to my faith of what I've heard because faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. Amen. So in hearing by the Word of God, well, she didn't have the Word of God to hear. She heard the testimony. She heard the testimony of God's people and what they have done in the past. How nobody stood in their way if God was on their side. Amen. Amen. So that should be our testimony around others. Is they say, you know what? I've never been to their church, but man, I can tell you, those people live for God. That person lives for God because when they go to do something, and because and, I know God's with them, nothing gets in their way. Amen. That should be our testimony. But verse 26, And as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That's three times. That's a testimony. That's a testimony. Even in the same book of James, that's a testimony of faith without works is dead. So faith requires action. Faith takes action. Amen. So let's look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll start at verse 4. Faith takes action. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, 
that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I don't know about you, but I'd like to be saved from corruption. Amen. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Let me read this from the Amplified Version. 2 Peter 1, verse 4. Let me go down to verse 5. For this very reason, reason, adding your diligence to the divine promises, employ every effort in exercising your faith. That means we're to exercise our faith. I don't think exercise is when you just sit there and do nothing. True exercise means you're going to get up, you're going to move around. You're going to get up, you're going to move around, you're going to put action to something. Because real exercise is going to require a depletion of energy. We'll say it's going to require energy to come out of you because you're putting energy into it. And it means you're going to burn calories in, in the physical sense. You're going to burn calories because you're putting action into something. Now, many people's faith doesn't get exercised, and so it never grows. So, but if we exercise, if we take action, we exercise our faith, what's going to happen is every time we exercise, our faith is going to grow. Then we exercise it a little more, and it begins to grow. And we exercise it a little more, and it begins to grow. We get this with a natural body. When you exercise, what you're actually doing is you're stretching those muscles. Technically, you're causing them to break to some regard, and then they heal themselves and get stronger and stronger and stronger. That's what makes muscles bigger. With faith, when you don't have any action, you'll never grow your faith. When you never exercise your faith, it'll stay the same. Remember, we're supposed to go from faith to faith, glory to glory. That means you're supposed to not stay on the same level. You go from one level to the next level. Then you go from that level to the next level. You continue to go up. You continue to go up because it's an upward calling, according to the Bible. So we exercise our faith and we cause it to grow. But it says, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue, which is excellence. That's what virtue means, is excellence. But it also means resolution. And it's also known as Christian energy. Mmm. Christian energy. So virtue is a Christian energy, is what that's talking about. So we should have a Christian energy about us. So for all those donut churches that sit around and do nothing but have coffee and donuts, that means they're not putting any virtue into their people. <laughs> they don't have any virtue. They're not teaching their people virtue. They're teaching them to, to not follow the Word of God because faith, true faith, takes action. It puts action to its belief, and it does something. It exercises it. It says, and in exercising virtue... You develop knowledge. You develop intelligence. Amen. You know, that's like, you know, us doing things around here, you know, remodeling, getting ready for God's graffiti, things of that nature. There's many things that, you know, I rely on Pete on because he has experience. It's gained him intelligence, so he knows how to do things. Then there's things that I do because I've gained experience. I've gained intelligence. Then there's things that Nick does because he's gained intelligence. So we, when we all come together, we're able to have that intelligence about us to get things done because we've all had different experiences now we don't rely on those experiences to be our excuse we rely on those experiences to give us intelligence to get things done to still fulfill an action but if we never do anything you won't gain any intelligence you'll just be stupid all your life (laughs) if you read the word of god that will give you intelligence Why? Because you're exercising your faith. You're exercising, let me read this, let me study this, and let me apply it. But true faith says, you not only read it, you exercise it, and it comes to life, and then it gains you intelligence. It gains you experience to help you to be a more mature Christian. Amen. Verse 6, in exercising knowledge, develop, and in exercising your knowledge, you develop 
you can self-control. And in exercising self-control, you develop steadfastness, which is patience, endurance. And in exercising steadfastness, you develop godliness. You have a godly character about you. You develop more of God in you to be more like Him. Why? Because you've applied, you're applying the Word as you learn it. You're putting it to use in your life, and it helps you to be more in His image and less of your image. Now, I like what John the Baptist said. He says, I may, de- he may, I may decrease so He may increase. Now, granted, we know that that's him talking naturally about his ministry is going to be diminished because Jesus is now, he was the forerunner. Jesus is now coming into the scene. So that means his his ministry is about done. That's what he's talking about. But I like to apply it with the spiritual nature of, Lord, may I decrease, may who I am decrease that you may increase in my life. So when people look at me, they see less of me and they see more of you. So, but that takes a exercise that takes a action and a faith combined because I've got faith in God of saying, all right, Lord, let me help me walk this out so I can exercise my faith and I may get it stronger. So that way, when you say, go and do this, I can say, all right, Lord, let's go do it. Because I've exercised that faith enough to say, if God says it, that means it's, it's going to happen. If God wants it done, it's going to happen. Instead of saying, oh, are you sure, Lord? Are you sure, Lord? Are you positive? All right, Lord, make it lightning twice real fast, and then I'll know that it's you. No, no, no. You exercise your faith, you'll know it's God. Because not only will the faith come and will be exercised, and you'll know that, yes, because of experience, I've been down this road before. I know how God speaks. I know how he works most of the time. I know how he works in my life, how he speaks to me. It will not only do that, but it will help me have a peace to say that's God. Amen. But you learn that through experience of how to work with God. That's like if, if you know, Miss Tiffany and I have been married almost 20 years. We've been married 19 this year. So with that, anytime the boys, one of the boys gets her phone and they text me with her phone, I can tell from the verbiage, that's not my wife. Somebody's got a hold of my wife's phone. And it's probably one of the boys. Now, misspelled words set aside, because auto could correct and can fix that too. But even how things are worded, I can tell that's not my wife. Why? Because we've walked together for going on 19 years. We've been married almost 19 years. So I can tell by now, if I haven't learned who my wife is and how she speaks and how she types things, I've been absent. I've been a horrible husband for 19 years. Would to God more Christians had a relationship with their God, know how he speaks, what his word says, know more about him, so when he speaks, they can say, yep, that's God. Nope, that's not God, because that's not how he would say that. That's not how he would do that. But that requires faith. And faith comes by hearing. So if you got your ears plugged in, I'm, nah, 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 I'm not listening to you. Nah, 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 I'm not listening to you. That's the way some people do in their marriage, and that's the way they treat God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So would to God people pull their spiritual fingers out of their ears, quit being spiritual retards, and listen to their God and actually walk with Him. Instead of saying, oh, it's all about me. Let me sit on my duff and not do anything. You get fat spiritually that way. By sitting and doing nothing. You gain head knowledge, which puffeth up, makes you a know-it-all, makes you a, a turd spiritually that nobody wants to be around. Because you stink with your own attitude. And everybody around you just wants to flush you. Uh, amen. Would to God more Christians would just walk with their God, exercise their faith, put action to what they believe, put action to the Word of God, and allow Him to lead them and guide them, and more things would be done. The kingdom of God, and I would dare say this nation would be a lot better shape if people exercised their faith instead of just quit hoping and praying for government to intervene. <laughs> amen. Amen. Uh. If you come looking for a Joel Osteen message, you come to the wrong church. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, so, verse 7. And in exercising godliness, you develop brotherly affection. When you develop godliness, you develop brotherly affection. It means you love one another. Now, I love how, how the Word of God is so wise. Let's read, read, this, read this from the... The uh, King James says, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. 
Why do you think that it causes, it causes a, says a brotherly, brotherly? It doesn't say like a mother and child. It doesn't say like two sisters. Why do you think it says brotherly? Because brothers are good for loving on each other and they're good at provoking one another. Because <laughs> brothers, they know how to love each other and to really you know, wrap arms around each other and just give each other bear hugs and just, yeah, I love you, I love you too. Then they also know how to push each other's buttons. Oh, come on now, come on now. Come on, you can do better than that. You can do better than that. Provoke each other to good works. That's what the Bible says. A true brother will push your buttons. But the same true brother will also love you up, hug you up when you need it as well. Because that's true brothers. Like our boys, all three of them are brothers, praise God. They can push each other's buttons and they can love each other all within five minutes. They can go from loving on each other and just, I mean, you just couldn't see a happier set of boys just loving on each other and then within five minutes be ready to kill each other because they're so mad at each other. Or, that's not how daddy says to do that. That's not how daddy says to do that. You better fix that. That's provoking one another to good works. Because especially when the, when, when the brothers know the fatherly standard, they can hold each other to it. They say, oh, now, come on now. You know that's not the way daddy wants that done. Thank you for your holy enthusiasm. Because spiritual brothers will say, come on now, you know that's what, not what Father God or how He wants that done. You know that's not how He wants it done. His Word says we're not to do that, we're to do it this way. We're not to do that, we're to do it wholeheartedly unto God. We're to do that with the spirit of excellence. We're to do this unto God. <laughs> that's what the Word says. So that's the reason that the Bible says brotherly kindness, or the Amplified says brotherly love. Is because you have that where, yes, you are going to love each other, but yes, there's going to be times where you rub each other the wrong way, but it should provoke you to good works. Because there's going to be times that you're going to rub each other the wrong way. And, but it takes that saying, oh, all right, Lord, that's my brother, that's my sister in Christ. You know I want to be upset right now, but I'm going to show the love of God in my heart, and I know that it's pushing my buttons to want to act in the flesh, but Lord, your word tells me I need to love them. I need to take care of them. I need to not be, I need not to get offended because that means I don't love the Word of God. Amen. Amen. But that takes action and that takes faith to prove, to make your action come into play. True faith will produce action. True faith takes action. Not just sits there and does nothing. Amen. So in exercising godliness, develop brotherly affection. And in exercising brotherly affection, you develop Christian love. That's like, that's like going back to the example of our boys, because that's the only boys I got. So only children we got. So when you do that, when you have that kind of attitude, you, you, you see them pick on each other. But if anybody outside of that messes with them, now you got all three of them to fight with. It's like they have the right to pick on each other and get aggravated and have little scuffles here and there, but by George, anybody else messes with them, you're going to have the whole crew on you side, on, coming against you. That's the way the body of Christ should be. We're going to have a little tension here and there and say, ah, oh, let me love on them, Lord. Help me to not be foolish. Help me not to act in the flesh. I love them. Let me not be offended by them. But then when the enemy tries to attack them, we take it to the Lord in prayer. How dare you, enemy? You're not attacking my brother. You're not attacking my sister in Christ. I call them blessed. I call you rebuked. That's the way we should be because it helps develop that Christian love, that true Christian love. And also out of that true Christian love, you'll want to say, hey, man, you know, you really shouldn't do that. The Word says this. The Word says that. Why? Because you're trying to keep them out of hell. But that takes faith in your God and that takes action of being the one to stand on the line and say, no, 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 don't cross this, brother, sister. Don't do this. Come on now. That takes faith in saying, Lord, I'm putting my faith in you. I'm putting my faith in your word. And I'm, I'm taking the action of not doing what I can to withhold them from crossing this line and offending you and coming against your word. So, Lord, may you help me. And may I take this action and may it cause them to be convicted. May it cause them not to cross the line 
and to not go against what you and your word says. That's still an action. But it is also a display of faith in your God and in the word of God that it's the truth. Amen. So coming back to this. Verse 8 says, For as these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you, they will keep you from being idle or unfruitful unto the full personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. So this verse says, For these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you. They will keep you from being idle. They will keep you from being idle. If you're idle, that means your faith is going nowhere. Or unfruitful. So your faith should help you bear fruit. Faith needs action to bear fruit and and show your relationship with God. Because if you sit idle and you do nothing, then that shows that you're not bearing any fruit and your faith is not being exercised. Because, you know, if you look at a tree, it's exercising its faith in its roots and its faith in the soil and everything that it's absorbing, it's, it's expressing its faith in it because it's absorbing every, all the nutrients to produce something. Now granted, we know it's not the faith like we're talking about, but it's doing its job to suck up all the nutrients, all the things, all the water, things like that from its roots, and it's producing something out of it. So even natural things can get this, but most Christians don't. Most Christians just, well, just let me let me stay here, let me... Let me get all I can out of this place, and when I'm done, I'll go somewhere else and get all I can out of that, and when I'm done there, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> that shows you, don't, you have a lack of faith. It shows you have a lack of faith. You put action to say, you know what, I'm going to dig my roots into where God has planted me, and I'm going to get all the nutrients I can out of this place, and I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to produce fruit. I'm not just going to sit here and be idle. I'm going to produce fruit showing not only am I here to stay, not only am I here to be part of this garden, part of this local body, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to be rooted and planted in God's Word and I'm going to produce a fruit because I walk with Him because my faith is producing action and producing things in my life. So now not only am I part of the local garden, we'll say, but now I'm producing things out of my own because I walk with God for myself as well. That still takes action. Amen. So verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind. (laughs) Whoever lacks these qualities is blind. I would say you're also deaf and dumb. Because if you're blind, you're not seeing what God's doing. You're not seeing the things that God's trying to show you to prove His, His reality, to prove, prove things in your life, to build faith. But I would also say you're dumb and deaf because one, you're not hearing because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, but you're also not exercising your faith by speaking to things either to use it as a testimony. Jesus said, speak to the mountain and it shall be removed. He didn't say look at it. He didn't say think about it. He said, speak to it. He said, you speak to the mountain and cast it into the sea, and it will do what you say. Because that's an exercising of your faith. Amen. Whoever lacks these qualities is blind, spiritually (laughs) short-sighted. That shows that you don't look past Friday. You don't look past the weekend. You just TGIF, TGIF, TGIF. It's like, really? That's all you got to look forward to is Friday? Oh, that's right. Because when you get off Friday, you like to go and get drunk, watch your pornos, and do all kinds of other things. Because you never focus on Sunday. Because Sunday's the, oh my gosh, it's Sunday already. I gotta go back to work tomorrow. I gotta go back to school tomorrow. I gotta do this all over again. That's the way Sunday gets treated. Why? Because you haven't exercised your faith to say, you know what, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Mm, wait a minute, that's not just for Sunday, that's for every, every day. <laughs> but that would require you to know you can walk with your God, which requires action. So your faith would produce things in your life. It would produce fruit if you actually put action to your faith. It says, spiritually short-sighted, seeing only what is near to him, And has become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. 
So that, sh that should tell you the state of some Christians and churches when all they see is, well, I can do whatever I want to now. I've been forgiven of my old sins. I can go back to what, I, what I've been doing. I can go back to my old sins. I can go back to this. I can go back to that. That shows you that they're spiritually blind. They're oblivious to the big picture because all they see is right here. All they see is right what's in front of them. They're not looking at the big picture of going to heaven. They're not looking at the big picture of gaining up crowns and jewels and things to lay at the feet of Jesus to say, Father, I thank you for allowing me to be your son. I thank you for allowing me to be your daughter. I thank you for allowing me to be your servant. Let me lay these crowns and these jewels at the feet of my Savior and the feet of my God that I can honor you. They don't think about that. All they think about is, what can I do now? What sin can I get away with? What can I do that the pastor won't see? What can I do on the weekend? How, how bad can I get drunk? How, how many people can I sleep with? How many pornos can I watch? How many drugs can I take? How many whatever? Because they look at... What's right in front of them. They don't look at the big picture of salvation and seeing Jesus Christ high and lifted up. Amen. But they're oblivious to the fact that they've been cleansed from their old sins. Because if you really appreciate what somebody's done for you, how somebody has set you free, you won't go back to where you were. I can, I can vouch for this. I had many a cousin who was thrown in jail and my grandma went and bailed them out and they, didn't, they barely even thanked her. And a few months later, they went right back to the same prison. Why? Because they're stupid. Stupid. Because they don't see the big picture of maybe I shouldn't do this anymore and I won't wind up in the same position. Their thought is, well, if I do this, grandma will always bail me out. Now here's the sad reality. Grandmama passed away. She's not there to bail them out. Who's left to help them? Just like many a Christian will say, well, Jesus, Jesus will bail me out. Jesus will bail me out when I need him. Jesus will bail me out right before I die. Jesus will take care of this before I die. And then all of a sudden they're dead and they're standing before God in judgment. It's going to be a little too late then because where a tree lies, or where a tree falls, so shall it lie. Means nobody can, we're not Catholic, nobody can pray you from hell into heaven. And nobody's going to pray you and from hell into purgatory just to set their idol until God decides what he wants to do with you. No, no, no. No, no, no. When you die, you're either going to heaven or hell. And however you lived, however, wherever your faith was, wherever you put your faith and trust and whoever you made your God, that's who you're going to serve for all eternity. Whether it was yourself or the devil, that will send you to hell. Or whether it was God, that will get you into heaven through Jesus Christ. Amen. But it says, because of this, brethren, verse 10, because of this, brethren, be all the more solicitous and eager to make sure, to ratify, to strengthen, to make steadfast your calling and election. Make steadfast your calling and your election. For if you do this, you will never stumble or fall. Pastor, why am I falling to the same sin? Probably because you haven't exercised your faith in that area of your life. Let's look at it from the King James. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That means your calling and your election in God, to be in Him, to be a Christian. If you do these things, ye shall never fall. Ye shall never stumble. Uh, what? Ye shall never. Never. Last time I checked, never means never fall or stumble so you mean the more faith that we have the less that we'll sin and the less that we'll fall to the things of sin that tells off on a lot of Christians faith why don't we have the Billy Grahams like we used to probably because there's nobody that walks in their faith like Billy Graham did why don't we have see the miracles like Oral Roberts anymore probably because nobody walks in their faith like they did now, I'm not lifting them up. I'm saying they walked with God, exercised their faith, saw things happen, and it kept building their faith. 
Whereas in the modern Christian, he just sets his faith on coffee and donuts being warm when he gets to church. Uh, amen. <laughs> See, that's why we don't serve it here is because one, gets you all sugared up and then you crash while I'm preaching or it wouldn't be hot enough and somebody would have to have a complaint about it because coffee's not too warm. The coffee's not warm enough. Coffee's too hot. The donuts are cold. The donuts are stale. It's like, why even go down that road? Why not just give the word of God and let it do its thing? <laughs> Amen. I've got six more pla- or I got four more places to read, and we're barely through the second one. Don't think we're gonna make it tonight. We'll make this part two, and then next week we'll make it part two, part two. <laughs> That's a joke. It's okay. Verse eleven. Let me go back and read verse ten again. Because of this, brethren. Be all the more solicitous and eager to make sure, to ratify, to strengthen, to make steadfast your calling and election. For if you do this, for if, if, there's that big two-letter word. If you do this, you will never stumble or fall. Pastor, are you saying that we could live a lot better life? Yes. How? By exercising your faith. Don't take... Don't be of those who draw back and say, well, I'm going to put my faith to something, and then all of a sudden you find a little bump in the road and you start drawing it back. No, 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 no. We're not of those who draw back. Because drawing back will get you into sin. You keep moving forward. I press on toward the mark. To the upward calling. You see how it's upward, it's forward, it's not back. Amen. Faith takes action. and moves forward and upward. Verse 11, thus there will be richly and abundantly provided for you entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I intend always to remind you about these things. Wonder why I preach a lot about faith and why I preach a lot about living right with God? Because if Peter is going to do the same thing, I'm going to do the same thing Peter did. I'm going to remind you about these things. <laughs> you know, Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll take the biblical stance on it. You remember the little lady who just kept, who kept just aggravating the the king. I think it was. He just kept, just, just, I mean, just kept on, just kept on, just kept on. He said, "All right, I'm going to give her. I'm going to give her whatever she wants, so she'll leave me alone." Maybe that's me in your life. Maybe I'm just the one that's, "Hey, come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it." Walk with God, walk with God, walk with God, walk with God. I'm going to write a song. Walk with God, walk with God, walk with God. Amen. So hopefully it will encourage you to walk with your God, if for no other reason, just to make me shut up. Amen. <laughs> I've got a lot more to offer for you than that, but if that's what I've got to be to you, that's what I'll be to you. Amen. I just want to see you make heaven. So I intend always to remind you about these things, although indeed you know them. I feel you, Peter. We all know these things, but we've got to be reminded of them sometimes at nauseam. Although indeed you know them and are affir- and firm in the truth that you now hold. Praise God. So hold fast to the truth. Hold fast to your faith. If you want to write this down, we may not turn there for time's sake tonight. But Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verses 2 through 40. You could technically do the whole, whole chapter. 1 through 40. But it's... We know we looked at it last week about what faith is. That's, that's Hebrews 11 1. But then verses 2 through 40 show you the great hall of faith for those recorded of living a life of faith unto God. It lists, it starts listing all these people that lived their faith out. And all of them had action backing up their faith. It wasn't just, well, they believed and all of a sudden it happened. No, no, no. They put action to their faith, and something God moved in every one of their lives because they not only believed it, but they followed through with action. So let's go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 11. Wherefore, 
Also, we pray always for you. That our God would count you worthy of this calling. You mean you got to be worthy of the calling? Yes. Now, to be worthy doesn't mean, oh, I've got it all figured out and I've got it, I've got it upright. I've got everything I never see and I never do anything else. No, no, no. That's not the worthiness that he's talking about. The worthiness is just saying, Lord, I love you. Lord, help me. Lord, cleanse me. Help me to walk with you. Help me to be holy before you. Help me to be clean before you. Lord, I sin. I repent. Forgive me. Cleanse me, Lord. That's how you become worthy. It's just walking with God. Being quick to repent. Quick to make things right. Being holy before Him. Being clean before Him. Putting more faith and trust in Him than on your own being. That's how you're worthy of the calling is walking with your God and allowing Him to be the God, the master of your life, not just the God that you wish upon a star for. But wherefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. The work of faith? So Paul here is saying there is a work of faith but it has power with it. Faith, when it's exercised, will build, will build with power. The work of faith with power. Verse 12, That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in Him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read this in the Amplified Version. With this in view, we constantly pray for you that our God may deem and count you worthy of your calling and His every gracious purpose of goodness. And with power may complete in your every particular work of faith, faith which is that leaning of the whole human personality on God in the absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness. I'm going to read that again. But it says... And with this in view, we constantly pray for you that our God may deem and count you worthy of your calling and His every gracious purpose of goodness and with power may complete in you and in your everyday particular work of faith, which is faith, which is, which is that leaning of the whole human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness. So notice it's all in His power, His wisdom, and His goodness, but that's where our faith is. That's where your faith must be, is in His power, His wisdom, His goodness, and we take action because of that faith in Him and who He is. That's like when, you know, when I step up to preach or teach or do something that's pastoral, I don't rely on my own wisdom. Because I'm like, if it's up to me and I was doing it on my own, I'd be like, blah, 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 I don't know what to say. I put my faith and trust in him. I said, Lord, you've anointed me. You've called me. So, Lord, I'm relying on you. I've got my faith and trust in you. I'm relying on you to help me to say what I need to say and to do what I need to do. And he has not failed me. Amen. There's been times where somebody's asked me a question, and I'm like, okay, Lord, you've got to help me with this. I need to be a pastor. I can't just leave this question open-ended. And the Lord would give me wisdom, and I was like, Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. You make me sound smart. But I know it's anointing. It's not me. So when you hear me say something smart, now you're going to say, is that the anointing or is that pastor? And I'm not going to give you the answer to it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let you decide on your own. Amen. But verse 12 says, Thus may the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be glorified and become more glorious and through and in you, and may you also be glorified in him because, uh, excuse me, in him according to the grace, the favor and blessing of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So through our work of faith with power, Jesus can be glorified through our faith because it takes action. He can be glorified in what we're doing. But it means that we've got to be doing something for him to receive the glory and the honor. We've got to be doing something to show the fruit that people can say, you know what? Man, I can see that God's blessed that. I can see God's anointed that. I can see God working in them. How can they see that? Because we're doing something for his kingdom. 
but that requires us to do something, and that takes faith and action. Amen. So let's, same chapter, let's go back to verse 3. Same chapter, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or it is fitting, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. So this says that our faith should be growing, not just growing, period, growing exceedingly. Our faith is supposed to be growing. It's not supposed to stay the same. Pastor, you sound like a broken record. Well, until this region and us, however the case may be, until we catch the heart of this and begin to do something about it, we're going, I'm going to be a broken record. Amen. <laughs> as it is meet or as it is fitting, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity, or we would say the love of every one of you, all toward each other aboundeth. So now not only do we have faith that's growing exceedingly, now we see that love is abundant to everybody that's in the congregation. Well, that sounds like Second Peter. That sounds like where you see that faith is being exercised, it produces a brotherly love and produces a Christian love. You can see how a faith, because you're exercising that faith, and I will say, I will add this, you know, we've been studying the Ten Commandments, we're working our way through those, but the first four have to deal with God. The last six have to deal with man, how you treat mankind, how you live with men, how you live with mankind, with other people. If you conquer the first four, you shouldn't have an issue with the last six. But that shows that you've built your faith in your God and in the first four, building your faith that when it comes to the last six, you're like, oh, I don't have to focus on these because I'm already fulfilling them. I'm, I'm already not breaking them, not breaking the commandments because I'm honoring God and honoring the first four and I'm walking with my God so it helps me to walk with man. But that requires a faith in not only God but in His Word and also requires a faith in who you are in God. Amen. But verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you, or boast of you, in the churches of God. Now that's not a denomination. <laughs> the, the churches that honor God. Amen. So if we, we're not careful, we'll be like Church of Christ, and because it says the Church of Christ, we'll think, well, that's a denomination. That's not what it's talking about. The churches that have Jesus represented in them. The churches that have God represented in them is what this is talking about. That truly walk with Him. And in you, in the churches of God, or among the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. That means you've got to do something to be persecuted. You've got to do something to go through tribulation. Because if you're on the enemy's side, there's not going to be any persecutions. If you're on the enemy's side, there's not going to be any tribulations because the enemy's got you right where he wants you. And if you're not doing anything for the kingdom of God, then the enemy's not going to bring anything against you because you're right where he wants you to be. Why do you think some churches grow with thousands of people? Because they're not doing anything against the darkness, the spiritual wickedness and darkness. They're, they're actually just not doing anything at all. The devil doesn't mind you going to church. He just doesn't want you to live for God. The enemy doesn't care whether you go to church or not. That's not a big deal to him. He just doesn't want you living for your God, knowing, knowing the Word of God, and walking with your God. That's what he doesn't want. When the Word comes alive in you and in your life through faith, and then you take action through that faith, that's what the enemy doesn't like. That's when you'll find that you'll fight, fight spiritual battles and the enemy tries to come against you. That's like any time that we go do something as a church, we take on a new level. I always like to say new levels, new devils. But when you take on that new level or about to do something for God, we expect spiritual warfare. Why? Because we're shaking the enemy's cage. Saying, hey, we're just reminding you we're here. We're just reminding you we're serving God and we're preaching the truth and we're not backing down. And we're encroaching on your territory or what you think is your territory, but it really belongs to God because now we're here. So, yep, here's your wake-up call. You might want to get to packing, enemy. 
and you serve him an eviction notice, he doesn't like it. <laughs> Amen. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like us taking over what's supposed to belong to him or what he thinks belongs to him. He thinks belongs to him. So verse 5, which is a manifest token, which is plain evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Well, if you don't do anything for the kingdom of God, you're not going to suffer anything. Because the enemy, again, he's got you right where he wants you. So we can see that faith takes action to endure, and it's also evidence of being counted worthy of God's kingdom. So faith takes action to endure. It takes action to endure something. Even if it's holding on, even if it's standing your ground, that's still an action. Because you're not moving backwards. You're not giving up. You're not giving up hope. You're not, you're not letting your faith dwindle. You're not letting your faith pull back. You're standing your ground. You're standing firm on the things of God. And you're not moving. That's still an action. Because even when you're fighting against the wind, even though you may not take a step forward, you're putting effort to stay in place until the wind stops and then you can move forward. There's still an action required to hold back the things of the enemy. There's still an action that is keeping you in place. And it's almost one of those, as soon as it let up, you almost want to fall forward. I've done that a few times where, I think we even done that in July when we were at the celebration thing for the 4th of July. It was like we were all holding on to our, our tent for dear life. And it's like the wind was blowing and we were just holding on. Then all of a sudden it let up and you're just like wanting to go forward. Like, oh man, man. That wind has finally stopped. Well, because the wind quit pushing up the resistance, the force that we had holding it, trying to keep everything together and keep everything in place, when that resistance was gone, it almost makes you want to fall forward. Well, in our faith, when that enemy's coming and trying to beat against us, we're to hold our place, and as soon as he lets up, we start moving forward. We don't just stand, stand still and say, oh, well, that was nice. Let me just stand here a while. No, no, we start moving forward. Because our energy was going into holding us in place, now we can put forth energy into moving forward. That should be our faith. Our faith should hold us still and fighting against the forces of the enemy, but our faith should move us forward every chance we get. Every time that we have the opportunity, we should move forward and keep moving forward and keep moving upward in the things of God. But it's an evidence. It's an evidence. Our faith should be evidence. So I'm going to read verse 4 from the Amplified. And this is the cause of your mentioning, of our mentioning you with pride among the churches, the assemblies of God. So there's another denomination, assemblies of God, which is not what this is talking about. For your steadfastness, fastness, your unflinching, unflinching endurance and patience, and your firm faith in the midst of all the persecutions and crushing distresses and afflictions under which you are holding up. Verse 5, Amplified. This is positive proof of the just and right judgment of God to the end that you may be deemed deserving of His kingdom, a plain token of His fair verdict, which designs that you should be made and counted worthy of the kingdom of God for the sake of which you are also suffering. So this, our faith should be evidence. Our faith should be evidence because it takes action. All right, last verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Last verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's start at verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. What? There's a testimony. Work of faith. Work of faith. <laughs> so the next time you see somebody that's just all about grace, you tell them what well, the Bible says multiple times about a work of faith. And faith without works is dead. But a work of faith. Again, that's not to buy our salvation. It's just proving our faith in God because it wants to do. And labor of love. So you have a work of faith. You have a labor of love. And patience of hope. Now the word patience there means enduring con con uh, continuance. Excuse me. Enduring continuance. 
And hope means confidence or an expectation. So putting that together, we would say, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and your enduring continuance of confidence and expectation in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So in other words, our work of love and our, labor, our, our work of faith and our labor of love is all based on our enduring continuance and our expectation, our confidence in Jesus Christ and who He is. We have a work of faith because we have that enduring continuance. We continue in the things of God because of what our belief and our faith is in Jesus Christ, we continue our work. We do our work. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we have a labor of love. Because we, when we have that work of faith, we're doing it because of what we believe in. But we also have a labor of love because we know we have a love for God. We have a love for Jesus Christ. So we're doing it. We're also doing the labor out of that love. So when we see faith, when we talk about the doctrine of faith, faith takes action. It doesn't just require it. It takes action because it wants to. It desires to. It says, that there's, I have too much faith to sit and do nothing. My faith wants to move. My faith wants to do something to show my appreciation and my love for my God. Because He's done too much for me to, for me to sit and do nothing. My God has done too much for me to not at least show Him my appreciation, to show Him my honor and reverence for Him and His kingdom. So may we as faith people, because we are a faithful church, may we have this proper doctrine of faith that faith takes action. We do, not just out of, we don't do out of religiosity. We do because our faith says we're honoring God. We do because our, our faith says I'm going to show my love and appreciation to God because He has set me free from sin. He set me free from death and hell. I don't have to go there. I don't have to face the sting of death. I can honor my God because He has blessed me beyond measure. Because I realize the bigger picture. I'm not nearsighted when it comes to the spiritual things. I see the big picture of giving my life, being a living sacrifice unto my God and honoring Him with all that I have and all that I say and all that I do to give Him my life because that's how much faith I have in Him and I realize what He has done for me. Amen. So may our faith take action. Not just because it requires it, but because our faith is that much in our God that we love Him and want to honor Him with all that we have and all that we are. Amen.